Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Lon Schiffbauer, and today we are going to talk about global production. I mean, this is kind of like the quintessential aspect of globalization, producing things with parts and materials and services from all over the world, and yet somehow or another we're able to do so with high quality and low cost. So how does all of that work? Well, that's what we get to talk about today. So let's first talk about production processes and standards, just the high level aspects of global production. Now, to do that, I first want to help us understand sort of how something, a product is cost, cost out and sold in terms of price and value, okay? because this will help us understand how global production helps us to create high quality, low cost products. Okay, so first of all, let's say we're making a pen, all right? We're making a pen. First of all, there's the cost of the actual pen, the cost of manufacturing it, all right? So maybe it costs 10 cents to manufacture this pen. All right, fine, that's great. But then we have a certain profit, right? We want to make some money off of this pen. So maybe it cost me 10, 10 cents to make. And gosh, I'd really like to double my profit. So I'm going to sell it for 20 cents, we say. All right. Well, that is the price per unit. This is now a 20 cent pen. All right. And by the way, nobody doubles their, their, their cost on a commodity let commodity like a pen, but bear with me. All right. So that's what you see it sold for in the store. All right. 20 cents. Cost me 10 cents, 20 cents, 10 cents more profit. But then we have this thing called value add. And this is simply something perceived by the customer, right? Value of the product to an average customer. They perceive this thing as having greater value than the 20 cents they're going to pay for it, right? So I particularly like the, the ink in this pen. I like the way it holds my hand. I like the, the flow of it and so forth. Therefore, I'm more than happy to pay 20 cents for the pen because I perceive that I am going to get more value um, out of that pen than the 20 cents that I paid for it, okay? So this is the value that we have created per unit on the pen, all right? Now, how do we make money? Well, one thing is we can lower costs, right? If we can lower cost, then we can still charge the same profit because we still have the same value add. And so if we are able to lower our cost, then we can increase profit, right? Whatever cost we save, we can roll into profit. All right. Now, another one is to increase the value add. In other words, increase the perception that this thing is really awesome. So if I took this pen and stamped an Apple logo onto the pen, I could then charge $37 for this pen because it has an Apple logo on it. All right. You see, I jest, but you see what I'm saying. All right is the value add is what really creates the impression of value to the customer. Now, in the case of global production, global production is really all about minimizing cost. We want to bring the cost down as much as possible so we can therefore increase our profit. All right. So, how does global production help us do this? Well, first of all, it really helps us increase the quality of our product. All right. Now, let me explain that. In this context, quality means reliability. Okay. So think reliability. 
implying that the product has no defects, lasts a long time, and performs well, right? So the firm that improves its quality control, increasing the reliability of the product, will reduce its cost thereby increasing the value proposition. Because if it's perceived as more reliable, if we come back over here, if it's perceived as more reliable, the value add will go up as well. So it's not just about the cost, it's also about increased value add because of the perception of greater reliability. Okay, so how is it that, that this increases, that re greater reliability decreases costs? Well, let me show you. All right, so we've got ourselves a product and we have improved the quality. We have improved its reliability. All right. Well, first of all, this increases productivity, right? Since things are going wrong less often, things are breaking down less often in the manufacturing process because we've really honed in on a strong process, then we can increase productivity. It also lowers rework and scrap costs. Rework meaning I had to try to put this thing three this thing together three times because it kept breaking, right? And because it kept breaking, um, we threw away a bunch of waste, all right? Well, waste costs money. So rework costs money and scrap costs money. Therefore, if we can lower rework and scrap, we are increasing our profits. Also lowers the warranty costs. Since this is a good, robust, solid, reliable product, it's not going to have as many, you know, warranty issues. Well, this means that we've lowered manufacturing costs and we've lowered service costs, which all means increased profits. So when a company asserts that, you know what, investing in quality control and increased reliability actually works against us. No, that's not really the case. The more we can control for manufacturing and service costs, the more money we can make. Okay. Now, this is all done through a process called Six Sigma. Perhaps you've heard of Six Sigma before. It is a statistically based process um, improvement methodology that aims to reduce defects, boost productivity, eliminate waste, and control costs, cut costs. All right. Now, to give you a very, very high level, almost embarrassingly simple example of Six Sigma and how it works, we're going to talk about slot machines for a moment. And to do that, I'm going to go ahead and get myself out of the way here and uh, introduce you to this process flow for a slot machine. It's $1 to play, and it's a 15-second cycle time, and it pays out 95% of the time. Yes, that's right. The slot machine does not pay out more than it makes. It pays out less, okay? so. In any case, let's, oh, whoa, wrong button, wrong button. Let's come back over here. Okay, so, so here's the idea. Here's the player side, right? The player inserts a dollar, pulls the arm of the slot machine. I know we don't pull arms anymore. That's the point here. Bear with me. And then does the player win or lose? The player has to make a decision. Am I going to play again? And eventually they quit. That's what the player does. It's a 15 second cycle time. Now on the slot machine side, it, it goes through all its machinations as the payout bucket full. If so, we move the coin over to the winnings bucket. If it's not, then we pay, put it to the payout bucket. And then the payout bucket sits there and waits. And then if they win, it activates the payout bucket and then it pays the winnings. Okay, you don't need to worry about that quite as much. Here's the point. All of this together took 15 seconds. Now, 
if we were to do the math, and don't worry, we're not going to read through all this math. But if we were to do the math, we'd say, well, if a player takes 15 seconds to play and it costs a dollar each time they play, then basically we've got $4 a minute going into that machine. $4 a minute goes into the machine. All right, fine. Now at 95% payout, right? Now 95% payout and say 50% utilization of the machine, all that. Basically, it means that the casino keeps $144 a day. At 15% cycle time, at 15 second cycle time, the casino keeps $144 a day. Now, if all we do is instead of pulling the arm, they push a button, we can reduce our cycle time to 10 seconds per cycle. And in fact, it's less than that, but bear with me, right? Well, at 10 seconds per cycle, that means that that machine is having $6 a minute pumped into it which means that once we calculate for payout and for 50% utilization, the casino keeps $216, right? So in other words, by simply reducing the cycle time of that machine by five seconds, the casino makes an additional $72 a day on that machine, okay? So that's kind of the idea of Six Sigma is if we can just find teeny tiny little ways of optimizing the process, we can make more money. Okay. Now, another aspect of Six Sigma is something called lean, right? Lean is a, a systematic method for eliminating the elimination of waste within a manufacturing system. So every system has waste in it, right? Or produces some sort of waste. And the system that can successfully control and reduce the waste produced is the system that makes the most money, all right? Now, to help demonstrate this idea, I want to introduce you to a Rube Goldberg machine. A Rube Goldberg machine is basically this, these famous old comics in which he, the, the, the author of these comics would create these horrendously over-engineered machines for very, very simple needs, all right? So now in the case of this, machine. This is an automatic napkin applicator. Okay. Let me show you how this, this works. All right. I'm going to go ahead and get a different color here. So first of all, this guy picks up the spoon and in picking up the spoon, he flips this, this spoon here, which then sends this cracker up to this parrot, Polly the parrot, when Polly eats the cracker, the crumbs overflow in his dish that then flow into this bucket. That pulls open this lighter, which lights this wick, sending this rocket up into space. Now, attached to the rocket is a sickle. That cuts this line, which then sends this pendulum going back and forth. Okay, back and forth because the pendulum attached to the clock um, is just now going back and forth with an app, a napkin attached to it. So this is an automatic napkin applicator. All right, now, anybody can see this is ridiculous and that's the point. However, let's look at why it is ridiculous through the lens of lean, okay? So lean, first of all, tries to eliminate waste in every way it can, right? And right away, I'm in the way here, so let's get out of the way to read this first part. Waste is an activity that consumes time, resources, 
or space, but does not add value to the product or service. Okay. So if I come on back, first one is overproduction. Overproduction is highly wasteful. And in this Rube Goldberg, he has that pen pendulum going back and forth now. He only needs one or two swipes, but now he has an infinite number of swipes. He doesn't need overproduction. Okay. Now, um, here's an example of overproduction. Let's say that, and why it's wasteful. Let's say that I manufacture these recorders. Okay. Well, in order to manufacture the recorder, I need to imbue it with money. I need to take money and shove it into this by manufacturing it. I buy the raw materials, I design it, I put it together, I pay people to do so, so on and so forth. So I have taken money and turned it into this. Now, I can turn this back into money by selling it. However, if I manufacture more than I need um, or that I can sell in the short term, well, now I have a whole bunch of products sitting around that I'm not moving, I'm not selling, and I have no money because I've taken all this money and shoved it into these products, which means my opportunity cost is really high because if another opportunity comes along for me to um, make some money, I can't take advantage of that because I have no money um, by with, with which to take advantage of that opportunity because it's all in my products. Okay, waiting. Waiting is, of course, wasteful, right? Now, not just because you're paying employees, right? Um, you know, just kind of sitting around downtime. It's pretty easy to understand that if you're paying an employee who is not producing anything because they're just waiting, then you're not getting any money for that pay that you're giving them. However, waiting also goes to your equipment, all right? You take this recorder, for example. I... I forget what I paid for it, but I've only used it two or three times. So let's say, for example, that I paid $200 for it, just making up a number. I paid $200 and I've used it twice, which means each time I used it, it cost me $100. All right. Whereas this camera that I'm using right now, well, now this is like a $2,000 camera, but I have used it so often that if you look at the per use cost, this is this camera was much cheaper than this recorder. Okay. So equipment sitting around not being used is very wasteful. Um, transportation, moving stuff around that doesn't need to be moved around, very wasteful. Extra processing. Now, when we look at our Rube Goldberg machine, you know, he would have to go through all kinds of extra steps to set that thing up and reset it and reset it and reset it every single time. That is a lot of extra processing. Then we have inventory. Now, I want to be clear. Inventory is not the same as overproduction. Overproduction says you have a whole bunch of stuff in which you have invested your money and you can't convert that stuff into sales. Therefore, you, you, you can't invest in anything else. Inventory cost is saying, okay, now that you have all these things, where are you going to put them? You got to put them in a warehouse. Okay, so now that means I have invested in a warehouse, but I am not making any money on that warehouse. I'm only hold, using as a place to hold my stock. So it's a cost. Now, if I have a manufacturing facility, a factory, that factory is not a cost to me. It's a revenue generator, right? So I'm happy to invest in a factory. But if I'm investing in a warehouse, I'm not making any money off of that, right? Furthermore, in inventory depreciates in value. 
you know that new stuff comes out all the time, and that means that the old stuff is less valuable. So I make one of these today, I can sell it for 200, but in three months, I could only sell it for 150. And in six months, I can only sell it for 100, and that doesn't even meet my cost. So inventory is very expensive. Motion, how much we need to move to produce something, right? If I need to climb up on things or if I need to dig down below in my manufacturing process. And then, of course, defects. Defects are wasteful. That's obvious. Okay. So, global production and Six Sigma really look for ways to increase the perceived value through quality and decrease the cost of manufacturing. That's how it makes more money. Okay. Now, there's a wide range of technologies out there now that allow us to really, really, you know, squeeze the most out of every dollar invested in our equipment, right? So, for example, setting up machines, it used to take days to set up a machine to run a certain product. Now we have really reduced setup time so that we can reset machines in the manufacturing process very, very quickly. That means we can use all of our equipment more often and keep it burning and churning more hours in the day rather than sitting idle as it's being reset. And of course, that means increased quality controls because we're using the same machine over and over, we really understand it, and so forth. Now, an example of this is what's called a flexible machine cell. You know, these are highly flexible groupings of types of machinery, say like four or six of these machines kind of all put in, in, in a line, and each one of them performs a certain um, process. Um, and by using these machines, you can produce all kinds of things. So, for example, okay, okay. See here, this is a this is a a, a water bottle, Camelback, uh, um, and Garmin Sharp. It was tossed by a, a cyclist during the tour of Utah. Okay, it's really, really, really cheap to put your name and logo on these things and uh, and order just like 50, right? You can go online and, and upload a logo um, to a shirt company and say, I want 10 t-shirts with this custom logo. And they're going to sell you these t-shirts at like $20 each. It is insane how cheap that is because it's a custom logo. But because these flexible machine cells are able to be set up and and uh, for each job, as it were, each work order so quickly and so efficiently, that means that even small orders like 10 shirts can be done very, very inexpensively. Okay. Now, who do you, you want to use a partner to help produce these things, right? If you outsource, we're going to talk about outsourcing versus doing this in-house in a moment. Who are you going to go to? Who are you going to call, right? Well, that's where the idea of ISO 9000 comes from. You've probably heard the term ISO 9000 before. This is a certification process that attests that a company's manufacturing process meets certain international standards of quality, okay? So that means that if I am a manufacturer and I want to attract customers from all around the world, I really want ISO 9000 certification because I can then show these potential clients that certification and say, look, my manufacturing process meets the highest standards of quality um, when it comes to, you know, reliability and, and cost and, and so on and so forth. So that way, 
if you are looking for a manufacturing or production partner, you don't have to dig deep to figure out and audit their processes. You just look for their certifications. Okay. Now, but that begs the question, should you manufacture in-house or should you outsource? In-house meaning you do it yourself. Outsource is you pay somebody else to do it. Well, let's look at the advantages and disadvantages. Let's first look at in-house, you producing yourself. Now, if you have really, really specialized needs and it requires equipment that is highly specialized to what you produce, then in-house may be a good option because you may have a hard time finding a production partner who uses that highly specialized sort of equipment. Now, also, if you are working with some really, really proprietary information, I mean, we're talking patents and trade secrets and things like that, you might want to look at in-house because you can keep those secret close to the vest. Also, if you have a keen interest in making this a core competency and you want to be the very best and produce the very best, well, the more you make, the more you produce internally with the specialized equipment and proprietary technology, the more you make, the better at it you become. And so your costs can still be controlled. Also, if you're doing it yourself, you control your schedule. And that can be a really big deal. If you're outsourcing to somebody else, you're kind of at the mercy of their production schedule. They have a hundred other clients that all have work orders placed and they've all they all need to be expedited because everybody needs everything yesterday. And so these manufacturers and producers are constantly trying to juggle all of these work orders. And um, if you need something right away, you might be out of luck unless you produce internally because then you control your own work order schedules. On the other hand, outsourcing. What are the advantages to outsourcing? Well, first of all, strategic flexibility. Let's say that, yeah, I think I want to go ahead and produce these things, but I'm not really sure it's a good bet, but I'm willing to give it a whirl to just kind of see if it works. Well, if I produce everything in-house, I have to invest in the equipment. I have to hire the experts. We have to you know, get everything ramped and so on and so forth. And so if two years later I decide, you know what, that was not, the, these things are not going to sell, forget it then I have invested a lot of money in a losing product. Whereas if I outsource that and it doesn't work, fine, I only signed a year contract. You can walk away from it, minimal loss to the bottom line. It's also cheaper in most cases um, because these production facilities, this is a core competency. They know what they're doing. They have their economies of scale nicely honed. So they can provide the production services at a lower cost than if you did it in-house. And finally, there's something called offsets. Now, offsets are when we bundle related goods and services into one agreement. So, for example, if I hire somebody to produce this, well, I want them to also take care of the packaging. I want them to take care of the warranty. I want them to take care of any patch updates to the software. Um, I want them to take care of any legal issues that may come up around the use of this. So that manufacturer will bundle all of that off and offset my cost and risk to the potential product. Um, whereas if I did all that myself, that is really expensive. OK, so that's another reason you might look at at outsourcing. OK, so let's say you know, whether in-house or out-house, out-house, <laughs> outsourcing, you need to decide where to produce. Where are you going to produce? All right. Well, you want to look at a few things. You first want to look at your country factors. 
you know, where are the economic and political and cultural conditions conducive to business? We're going to talk more about that in future lectures. We also want to look at technological factors, right? Where do they have the infrastructure, the power, the roads, you know, the water, the, you know, don't underestimate the importance of basic infrastructure, okay? Now, you also want to look at, well, the nature of the product that you're making. Let's say that you are making a product that can basically be sold anywhere with minimal localization, minimal customization. We're going to talk more about strategy in a future lecture. But right now, if I am selling this thing internationally, there's not a lot I need to change, right? I mean, not a lot at all. Okay, there's there's hardly any English written on this thing at all. Um, a few numbers and so forth. And the way it works is the way it works. It doesn't really matter what your local custom is. So that means that I can probably make all these things in one location and export them, ship them around the world. Well, that's kind of cool because that gives me low fixed cost. All right. I can serve the world out of one single location and maximize my economies of scale. On the other hand, let's say that, no, actually, I'm making something that, and I'm looking around, I can't find anything that would need to be highly localized. But let's say that I'm making something that needs to be highly localized, all right? Things that no matter where I'm selling it, I'm going to have to change the product a little bit. Well, in this case, I'm probably going to have to either set up or outsource to several factories around the world. All right. This means I'm going to have really high fixed costs. Operate locally out of multiple locations to be more responsive to local market needs and be less dependent on any one market facility. So you kind of kind of you've got to kind of weigh the pros and cons of localization and fixed cost. Okay. Now I keep talking about economies of scale, and I recommend that you research that. Um, it's it's a basic economic principle that is is very powerful and important to understand. The idea here is that you have your per unit cost, all right? Per unit cost, um, let's, let's say this thing is a per unit cost of $100, okay? $100, but I have then output. The more of these things I make, the less expensive per unit it becomes because... Well, if I buy one machine and make one unit, well, now my per unit cost was a million dollars. But if I make two from this one machine, now my per unit cost is half a million dollars. Well, if I make a million from this one million dollar machine, my per unit cost is a dollar, right? So the more your output goes up, the more your per unit cost goes down. This is wonderful and fantastic and marvelous. However, there's a bottom to this, right? At a certain point, you're going to hit your minimum efficiency scale, in which case you're going to have diseconomies of scale. Meaning, listen, my factory can only produce about a million of these things before I have too many people and too much raw material and too much equipment kind of running around and we're all getting in each other's way. So that means I'm not going to be able to increase my production so things become flat, but we're getting in each other's way. And furthermore, we're probably gonna have to buy another machine and maybe even another factory, which all of a sudden means my cost per unit just went up because I'm not accounting for one machine and one factory. I'm now accounting for two machines, two factories, 
And so now things go up and I have to do that whole thing all over again. It keeps going and going and going. Okay. So it's an important concept to understand when it comes to global production. All right. You also want to look at when deciding where to produce regional economic integration agreements, right? So these are things like, you know, hey, you know what? The United States and Canada and Mexico all agree to reduce to the extent we possibly can all the trade barriers so that we can have free trade between member countries as um, much as possible. This relationship here, I believe, is called the USMCA, right? Um, US-Mexico-Canada Agreement, all right? Used to be NAFTA. Um, over here, this green area, we have the EU. That's the European Union. You notice uh, England and Scotland, Britain and Scotland, Britain, I should say, is no longer um, part of the EU. By the way, England's gotten two different countries. Britain is the combination of them, as well as that little dot right there of Northern Ireland is part of Britain. All right. So anyway, so the EU has a trade agreement. And then there are um, other trade agreements all over the world. Now, the really nice thing about operating within a trade, trade agreement country or operating with a trade agreement country is um, lower barriers, lower tariffs, lower costs, right? So works really well. Now, the creation of a single free trade zone opens up new markets that had been previously off limits. So people like to be part of these trade agreements. Um, this demonstrates here the free trade agreements that uh, the United States, Office of the United States Trade Representative, these are all the countries and agreements that the United States has in place. In some cases, the United States has agreements with particular countries, right? In other cases, we also have them all together, like the USMCA here, that trade agreement we just talked about. Um, so these are countries with whom the United States tries to maintain as low trade barriers as possible. Now, of course, why do we do this? Well, it enhances our comparative advantage, right? You do this, you do this, I'll do this. And if we all do it at the lowest um, opportunity cost, then we put it all together into a product that becomes a very inexpensive, affordable product for our, for our citizens, all right? Now, there's other reasons as well. We want, to create an in, we want to create incentives for political cooperation among member countries. The idea is we're less likely to contend with one another when our economic futures are inextricably linked. So a great example is the European Union, the EU. Well, if you look at the countries that are part of the EU, um, these are countries that like went through two world wars together. And even before the world wars, they were always, con you know, contesting. They were always going to war. They were always in disagreement. And so they really wanted to become a major player on the world economic stage, as well as intertwine their economic futures so that they would be less likely to go to war and more likely to cooperate. OK, now. That isn't to say that the, these free trade agreements and so forth are like perfect in every way, shape and form, not in the least. One thing that can happen is it can result in trade diversion, okay? Now, trade diversion is replacing low cost goods outside of the free trade area with higher good costs from within the area. So here's the idea. The United States, um, has 
good, solid free trade with Mexico, right? And that means it's really easy for us to move goods back and forth and so forth. But let's say that Taiwan has a part that I need in the U.S., and it is less expensive um, than that which is available in Mexico. Well, now I'd probably have to go back and see whether or not Taiwan's a good example to see if we have a free trade agreement with Taiwan. But for the sake of this example, let's say that we don't have one with Taiwan. Well, I might say, well, you know what? I'm just going to go with Mexico and the more expensive product because they're a close trading partner and it's easier rather than kind of go through the mess of getting it from Taiwan, even though it's less expensive. So in a way, it prevents the free market of supply and demand from working because it creates this artificial connection between between two producers. All right. So that's one of the um, one of the counter arguments to economic integration. Nevertheless, tends to work pretty darn well. OK. And so there you go, folks. A primer on production. You can, I mean, you can do PhD dissertations on global production. So trust me, this was a whirlwind ride. Nevertheless, I hope it was helpful, gave you a little bit of insight. Stick around. We have more to come. And uh, until then, have a fantastic day.